Ugh. And I will pass over to Lewis. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Adam. Um, could I, could you stop sharing and then I'll, thank you. Right, how did we do this before? So we went screen two. See my very pretty background? It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So, hi everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to well, an absolute pleasure to be, be here. Uh, and it's even more of a pleasure to be talking about uh, this topic. Um, so, uh, as I've already been introduced, um, I'm Lewis. Uh, so I'm currently working as a research associate for the Jewish Museum, where we've been mapping, uh, we've been looking through the uh, card collections and we've been uh, trying to present the information with them in different ways. Um, in one of the blogs, I wrote kind of that um, these temporary shelter cards are kind of, they're almost mundane items of bureaucracy, but contained within that is the potential to show off and visualize that data in various different ways. And um, as the title of the project indicates, is that one of the most exciting things you can do with them is you can put them on a map. Um, and maps are great because they're so easy to, it's just such a more efficient way um, of showing information. Um, although, for the record, uh, I do lots of other things. Uh, in fact, I, I do so much else. I, I, I rely on my calendar to tell me what I need to do at certain times. Um, so I'm primarily a research student at the University of Essex, where I'm almost submitted my PhD. We're talking like we're, by Friday next week, um, although I think I've said that for the last four months now, um, but we're getting there. Um, obviously, this isn't a counselling session for me and my PhD, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure we can set up another one for that later. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm primarily, I'm a history student and I've looked at things like, uh, I've written about British Rail, uh, I've written about, uh, my PhD is on the British Overseas Airways Corporation, uh, which became BA, uh, and I kind of, give a bit of an insight into how their um, slightly nefarious imperial uh, background kind of kicks in at certain times. Um, but I've been doing that so long now, I, I do not want to bore you with some of the details of that. Um, so again, just a few things to outline on this workshop. So I would absolutely want this to be as informal as possible. If there's anything that you want to ask at any point, please just unmute and say, um, please stop me if I'm going too quick or I'm rambling about something that's not relevant. Um, this is, I want this to be really, really informal. Um, but generally keep yourself muted um, just in case, um, because uh, well, I'm a bit worried about a helicopter flying over because I live near a military base uh, and it might sound like World War Three in this flat. Um, but please bear with me if that happens. Um, so I have prepared a few different files on a G drive for everyone, which is available here. Um, it's the same one as the one that's been sent round. So if you've already, and if you're already in that drive, fantastic. But if you're not, could you go into that drive and just take a look at the spreadsheet? Well, just double check that you've got access to everything, first of all. And that should be a that should be four spreadsheets, a links document, and this presentation. If there aren't any objections, I'll carry on. That's a compositive. Excellent, fantastic. Um, so these are oh, I'll move the next two points along. Um, so uh, the idea I want to get here is. Um, I'm going to give us some time to kind of play around with those spreadsheets and kind of push us in that direction um, throughout the workshop. And I'll kind of give hints and we'll try and kind of work through these together um, to try and give you a bit of experience in what you need to do to prep data to go into a map. And we'll eventually be using something called Palladio, which is one of the, it's one of the most straightforward tools, um, but it requires a bit of negotiation at the early stages, but we'll get into that as time goes on. 
Um, but also, don't worry if you fall behind. Um, each version of this spreadsheet, you'll notice is numbered one, two, three, and four. So I'll let you know which spreadsheet we're on at a certain time. So you could completely ignore the first three and just upload the final spreadsheet. Um, so don't worry if you're falling behind, but if you can, do try and give things a go. Just um, have a bit of a play around with the data. Um, otherwise, are there any questions so far? Excellent. Right. So um, there's so I, my background is history, as I've mentioned before, and I uh, okay. I'm trying my best not to make this a counselling session for me, um, but I uh, I live with a computer scientist um, who would always tell me and show off all of the fanciful code that he'd, that he'd written um, and all of the marvellous and wonderful things it did. Um, and it always made me feel a bit upset that I didn't know what I was doing as a, as a programmer, as a historian, that, I wasn't, uh, that my stuff didn't look very nice. So I've compiled the list of rules here um, that are incredibly important for any kind of digital project like this, especially if you don't come from an IT or computing background. Um, computers are great, but there is no such thing as perfection. We're not looking for perfection. Uh, no program under the sun is perfect. Apple may proclaim that its iPhones and software are perfect, but they aren't. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, you can't get everything spot on. This is probably the, the greatest lesson ever is that Google is fantastic. And more importantly, don't feel guilty about Googling things. Um, and particularly copying and pasting stuff from Google. Um, everyone does it. Even if they say they don't, they do. Um, code in particular is, you could spend hours trying to get the syntax right, or you could spend 10 seconds copying and pasting the code over and don't feel guilty about that, basically. Um, again, we're all human. We're going to make mistakes. Um, there are countless numbers of mistakes in these spreadsheets that I've spent hours weedling out. Uh, so no doubt I've left one or two in. We can have fun trying to find those. Um, complex is the enemy. So code that looks like, uh, you know, a, 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 when people are hacking in real life and there's long lines of for loops and it, that's rubbish. If you can't interpret the code, then all you've done is create code that you can't interpret. Um, so don't worry about how things should look. Um, worry about how they work for you. Um, and if you're passing this code on to a client, um, then you probably should know how to code anyway. Um, I'm saying this, but we won't be doing a whole lot of coding at all in this session, but the same principle applies. Um, and value your time. Uh, so there's a big um, there's a big kind of push about automating an AI going through kind of the, the uh, society at the moment that you should get a computer to do it. Um, that's okay if you value that time appropriately, because code takes time to write. Um, a lot of the time, manually doing things, even if it may be a big job, is better in the long run. Um, and here in particular, I've prioritized us putting in a lot of this information manually because it's more efficient in our time. There are ways of automating stuff as we'll go through, but primarily um, just remember that your time is valuable either way. And that sometimes for accuracy's sake, it makes sense to um, not waste time automating things. Anyway. Uh, there, my rule again. This isn't a counselling session for me, but hopefully this should make you feel a bit better about where we're going. So, moving on to the session. So, what is a geo reference? Does anyone have any kind of original thoughts about what a geo reference is? About what they're expecting from a geo reference? Feel free to use the chat or speak out loud. I don't mind. Um. I use Flickr and they can apply georeferences to our photos and then show you a world map where the photos are. 
Is that the sort of thing that we're talking about? Yep, absolutely. Uh, the, ben the benefit of the term here is that georeference is actually a bit of a non-term um, because uh, it, it's broadly any process of attaching geographic information to some kind of digital object. Um, and Flick is a fantastic example. Um, in fact, uh, I like to think I, I came up with um, I don't think that I came up with that before Flickr did, but unfortunately they won't let me have any uh, shares or anything. Um, but it is basically the it is the associating a digital image or a digital file of some kind with a location in physical space. Um, and I'd say that applies to literally any piece of digital information. So you can geo-reference so a Word document, a picture, presentation, um, points on a map, they're all different uh, ways of geographically referencing stuff. Um, so this is done primarily, uh, as Richard has actually uh, said already, um, by using latitude and longitude coordinates, um, which are a standardized system of measuring. Um, so, Basically, a latitude and longitude coordinate is a way of converting areas on the globe to a flat map, basically a flat graph. So essentially, we are just playing around with a big graph. Um, this comes with problems because latitude and longitude isn't perfect. Um, there are various different problems that are with um, how you get those numbers to work. Uh, so for instance, you can't put a square on a circle. It just doesn't work. It's not a particularly accurate way of measuring something. Um, however, we won't be going that deep. Um, essentially, it is just working with one big graph that broadly speaking, and for the most part, represents uh, these locations in physical space. So, this is done, and there's a fantastic um, introductory article here called um, Georeferencing Best Practices, um, which is my kind of article because it's very serious, but it does tell jokes throughout. Uh, so it's quite a lighthearted. I totally recommend reading that if you're interested in georeferencing. Um, so originally, latitude and longitude is measured uh, as a DMS coordinate, so degrees, minutes, seconds. Um, which is denoted by the, the degree symbol, the uh, comma symbol, and the um, uh, basically that's kind of your, your traditional method. Um, I think, again, I know more about the digital kind, um, but this kind of georeference is most used as kind of a, a standard in navigation. However, we're looking at digital latitude and longitude, which gets rid of all of that um, degrees, minutes, seconds, and just focuses on what are basically just geographic X, Y coordinates. Um, really clever software can do a Z coordinate as well. So you can actually pitch altitudes. Um, we'll be playing around with another variable in that, which is the dates as well. So it's more than just latitude and longitude. Um, but you'll notice that all of these are in various different degrees of precision. So 510 is, in essence, uh, kind of the core here. Um, and as you can see from this graphic, which I actually stole from the GVIF Georeferencing Best Practices, um, it really does depend on what you are trying to achieve with your latitude and longitude coordinate. Um, and again, we can't decide this yet. We have to see the data before we can pick which level of accuracy we're going for. Um, so that's something that we'll step back and do in a moment. Um, and this can be this can be where that perfection rule comes in a little bit, um, because it's all very well and good getting a really really accurate coordinate, but it depends on what you're trying to represent um, and kind of the at what level that matters, and you'll see what that means. So let's have a look at 
So just to illustrate that further, this is, don't worry too much about the code on the right. Um, this is a map that is from the, uh, let's use the map box one. Map, map box one is more cheerful. Um, so what I've done here is I've basically drawn a line through the point zero, zero. And so from this is this graph basically represents every point on the map. So we have here the coordinate for the Jewish Museum London, which is 51.535374 and minus 0.1446. And that is exceptionally accurate. Um, and again, it's your standard graph. So everything to the left of this line uh, will be minus, everything to the right of this line will be positive, and the same difference here. I'll do that, I forget how big the globe is. Okay. Are we all okay with basic latitude and longitude coordinates? Hello, cat. <laughs> So, let's start digging down into data. So we have here uh, examples of different categories that are available to us on these temporary shelter cards. So this is the one that I've uh, basically stolen from the web page, but the various different uh, types of information here. So. Uh, case numbers, uh, dates of arrival and departure, um, just going through a few. So the number in the family, name, wife, birthplace, nationality, children, age, trade, means. Um, that's a lot of information to deal with. So which ones are we thinking are gonna be the most useful for us as geo-references? What do we suspect? I would say birthplace, possibly. Yep. yep, that's very that's a that is a good one. So we'll we can we can tag where people were born. Any others? I've just noticed the chat come on. Yep, destination is another good one. Just going through here, so um, case number, it's not really useful geographically, neither is their arrival or admitted or arrived from. Arrived from is the other one that I tag as well. So um, again, so to chart how the uh, temporary shelter itself worked. So this document kind of served in the middle. So someone would leave a destination, they'd arrive at the Jews to, uh, Jewish temporary shelter, They'd fill out this form and then spend an, an amount of time at the shelter and then go elsewhere. So we've kind of got a pathway from somewhere where they're coming from, somewhere where they're stopping and somewhere where they're going to. So there's quite a neat little pathway there that we can follow. So let's have a look at the spreadsheet first before we get on to the problems we've got with it. So we have. If you'd like to open, download and open spreadsheet one called Dummy Spreadsheet Unclean. Uh, this can be done in either Google Sheets or Excel. Um, I would probably recommend Excel if you've got that available to you. Are we all good? So this is a representation of the data that I had presented to me when I started this project. So it's basically everything laid out, um, everything filled in as much as possible. Um, incidentally, uh, I say it's the same. I've scrambled a lot of this information and I've made a lot of the numbers completely random. 
So um, in the interests of GDPR information, this is all completely safe. Um, and also incidentally, uh, the destination, some of the addresses on there were uh, ran came from a random address generator. So if your address is on there, that's an extremely spooky coincidence, but I promise you that is just a coincidence. It's a random address generator. So I do apologize if your address is on there, <laughs> but this is pretty good as information that we've got here. But are there any problems that, we're going, that we think we're gonna come across? Is there anything that as humans looking at this sheet might be problematic when we're trying to convert those to locations? might be worth spending a minute or so just kind of picking out where the problem points might be there's there seems to be a confusion between the city and the country um and pr presumably the names and countries may have changed borders and whatever since they were written so um having some consistency may become really difficult Yes, absolutely. In fact, actually, you draw upon something that uh, I hadn't written down to mention, but that is utterly uh, essential to how we decide to map these. So you're quite right. First of all, um, one of the more common occurring places is Czechoslovakia, which doesn't exist. That's not a nation anymore. So we're going to have to decide in some way how we represent that on a map. Because we're a, because this is a kind of an introduction to georeferencing, I'm going to avoid playing around with borders. So we'll just focus on, uh, we'll just round. Uh, I think the default uh, geocoding just puts that to the Czech Republic. I think that will do for today, um, but that's an utterly important point. Uh, and you're also quite right. There is a real confusion here between what are we talking about? Are we talking about cities? Are we talking about towns? Um, if we go through here, so Prague, that's useful. Glasgow, that's useful. Um, oh, local, that's irritating. Um, Frankfurt, that's fine. Okay, Poland is not the same as Vienna. They're two very completely different ways of defining a place. Um, Again, locals coming up again, um, whatever that's meant to mean. <laughs> um, Essex RAF station. Uh, that's there. Are, so there are there are issues that are going throughout here that will require some kind of cleaning. Um, so just to check my list and see, I've got everything. I think it's name over. That's that's the other thing I think is also worth noting is that. Excel treats dates in an unusual, well, it's not unusual, but Excel treats a date as a unit that's not the same as uh, a number, a full stop. So this, this is text. So this is 27.11.45. That's what we call in data terms a string. So there's no numeric uh, kind of property there. You can't add one and it'll add a day to that. You can't add a time to it. That is just, it's basically just the set of words that happen to read 27.11.45. And that's not useful for a computer because computers don't understand that. So there are a few other little issues that we need to come across. So let's have a go. There's not many that need cleaning. So I think the easy one to start off with is, so shall we say local? Where do we think local is in this grand scheme of things? Uh, Bag Baghdad. Okay, that's, that's an interesting one, that's true. Or, thinking... or Tredgar Square. Or or Utrecht in the. I, I I actually think you're being. I think you're actually trying to go down the cleverer path. I think it might be a bit 
blunter than that. I think actually um, local is just, because you imagine that everyone's going to have been in London and they're going to be filling out the forms. So I imagine London is probably what they mean just because that's where it happens to be filled out. I think that's a reasonable assumption we could make. And what this is suggesting to us, um, that was more interesting. That's a bit of a cheat. Um, so what this is suggesting is the ways we can make this easier for us down the line. Um, so this is what we call the difference between implicit data and explicit data. So again, I'm very sorry if this is your address. That's an unbelievable coincidence if it is. Um, but what can we guess? What, what's implicit in this date? Do you think? London for me, but <laughs> or, or local basically. So yeah, yeah. London yeah. assuming your scribe is in London. Yeah, it could be in Hull or somewhere. Yeah, so basically, basically, again, we, we'll, we'll kick into the rules that we had earlier, which is we shouldn't feel guilty for Googling anything. So if you, go, if you Google this specific address, you come up with a place here uh, in uh, 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 Ilmington or Illing. I should have practiced my pronunciation before I came, or indeed picked one that was somewhere that I could pronounce. Um, but we've got a town. So we, we go from what is an address to a town. And there's another assumption we can make here is that it's in England. So we've gone from an address. We've taken that single address, which is in many ways unhelpful. And we've taken a step back. And we know what town they're in. We've taken another step back. And we know what nation they're in. Um, and we can see that's going to be quite useful to us. So obviously a lot of these say, um, so Glasgow is fine, but so how do we distinguish between those that are nations and those that are um, towns? So I wonder how it's best to do this. I wonder, let's give it a go. So. Have a go at cleaning this spreadsheet up. Find the errors and see if you can basically remove them. Make your life easier. Make everything as consistent as you can. Okay, shall we say about five minutes on that? Is that okay with everyone? I'll have a bit of a play on here as well. So you'll see me cleaning up as well. I'll actually mute myself or you hear my annoying clicking as well.
how are we all getting on? Are we kind of, what kind of things are we doing? All feeling confident? It's about 30 more seconds, I reckon. It's interesting when the data is presented in a spreadsheet like this to see the variations in how the original people were recording these places. And um, it's something when you have the cards in front of you, it's something you don't notice straight away because you're not looking particularly for that inconsistency. But when you start having on a spreadsheet like this, just things like Czechoslovak, Czechoslovakia, um, and all the variations, it really become apparent. Yeah, I, I did a filter on the nationality, and there's entries written as Czechoslovakia, and then Czech Czechoslovak, and then Czech. And I suppose there's going to be endless um, variations of those. Yeah, absolutely. The one that uh, I, I don't know whether I am ashamed to admit this, but uh, no, no, there's no shame in this session. Um, but the one that really stumped me for ages was what on earth does CS mean? I cannot work out. I've spent ages thinking, what, what is CS? What could that possibly refer to? Yeah. Czechoslovakia. Yeah. But that, that, this is yeah. the, the important stage where we need to make our lives as easy yeah. as possible. Um, yeah. So anything that we can do to kind of alter yeah. that. But he, even today, the Czech Republic is now known as Czechia. And in a year's time, it might be something else. So how on earth uh, are you supposed to inter interpret this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, that this is a problem of dealing with history data. Um, again, it was surprisingly difficult to find um, like historical borders or lists of historical country names um, and their associated geographic references. Because I think, uh, I think this might be a broader comment on uh, people doing history and kind of it not matching up with tech, um, because obviously the tech is always pushing forward, but actually we want to almost archive some of that information. Um, again, but it's interesting to see, actually, while we're here, I wonder, no, I might say, I'm going to save that. I'll save that for a second. So, I mean, what other things have people been doing? That Getty thesaurus is very useful. I've, I've used that a lot. I advise my students to use that. Um, not enough things do that. Um, it'd be so useful if more things charted that change over time. Absolutely. So a couple of things that I think are worth noting here again that will make our lives a lot easier when we start going into things like palladio um, is this idea of dates because dates are a bit awkward so this date here okay well, let's make life easier these represent two different kinds of information so this is a normal this is a string this is an Excel iterated date. So we can see this because if we change its format, Excel identifies a date as a number. So this that's, is actually- That's actually the number of days since the 1st of January, 1900. Absolutely, yeah. And that's exactly what Excel is doing. It's just presenting it to you in a nicer way. Um, so we can change the format back to that. Um, this one, on the other hand, is just, that's all it says. There's, there's nothing there. And even if we tell it to be a date, it won't because there, it doesn't see a date there. Um, so we need to highlight all of that column. And we need to go to text to columns. 
and we can basically click next and then next again, go on to date, making sure it's date, month, year, and then finish. Now, we know their dates, but we can double check that it's understood that correctly. Yep. But what we also notice here, and again, this was quite a late stage discovery. So again, uh, as Adam was saying, it's very interesting to see how people record these. Um, and actually, if we want to make our lives really easy, it's a bit awkward to have a date of arrival and a date of admittance. It doesn't really work very well. And we've got a lot more admitted. Well, actually, that's not true. I've been a bit, um, the, this doesn't represent the whole spreadsheet. But in the actual one, um, there's a lot more admitted on dates than there are date of arrivals. What we know, though, is that often they'd scribble over both. So it'd be 11th of June, 48, scribbled on both lines. So if we want to make our lives really easy, we could just merge them. And that's exactly what I did on the main spreadsheet. Again, we'll, I'll kind of show this off when we get to two as well. Um, is there anyone, anything else here that people noticed as kind of problematic or needed a bit of shuffling or? I did, I did some similar cleaning up on the birthplace and arrived from to, just because um, we've got a mixture of cities and countries um, and on the birthplace if I've got um, row 27 I think birthplace I've got IV 1891 which I have no idea what that is um, but I've just gone through and gone th run through my filters and just highlighted anything that doesn't really make sense to me that probably needs a bit more a bit more work yeah absolutely and if I find something that I can't deal with, I'll just highlight it in yellow and move on. Um, Adam has seen the, the messy spreadsheet and there's quite a lot of bits in yellow as well. Um, yeah, that's, go on. I was gonna say, it was still about, I suppose you have to make an arbitrary decision about the scale you want to work at at some point, don't you? You know, yeah, some, absolutely. But, city or country and it's like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could create more columns to, you know, to always have like the country scale available or something. And, and row 22, mm. the birthplace is given as Czechoslovakia, comma, Poland, which presumably is a, an either or. Well, it's Ches Chestakova. Oh, it's sorry, it's I'm reading that wrong. Yes, Chestakova, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it, but these are, that's an important point. I do apologise if you can hear an ice cream truck that's just going past my window. Um, that's really throwing me. Uh, that, that always does that, stupid ice cream van. Um, so it, it is about you now. It's like we've gone from it being a task of a computer that will take the, project, uh, take the problems on to now, now you have to make a decision about what you keep and what you remove. And you have to decide what level you're going for. Um, I'm a passionate believer in working smart and not hard. Um, so if at all possible, let's keep as much data in as we can. So I thought a good thing to do would be to disambiguate the place uh, as a town and the place as a nation. So in the actual one, I go through and I openly break those out where possible. Um, so that way we've got both a national data and a town data. Um, and that's useful for a couple of reasons. Not just because a lot of computers prefer to georeference towns rather than nations, but actually we get more information out because obviously Paris will tell you that someone's in Paris, but it also tells you that they're in France. Um, whereas, a good example, Canada tells you they're in Canada, and that's it. So it might be interesting to see what we can do, knowing that we've got a nation 
interval as well. So we can see like flows between nations, and then we can filter out and we can go just for flows between localities. So it's giving us that flexibility early on. So I think, have I pointed out everything that's awkward? Yes, I think that's primarily a good time to shift on to spreadsheet two, which will look like this, where I've done, I've basically gone through and um, formatted everything correctly and eliminated things that aren't useful. Um, and again, I can't emphasize how useful this is, but keep a change notes. So this is everything I've done to each column. In particular, the split between arrived from nation and arrived from. This is going to be really useful for us. But obviously, it's not going to be that useful yet because we haven't done any geo referencing on it. We've just made our lives easier for it. So to show off, so this is Google's geocoding API. Um, I was going to do a fancy demonstration. I've left it on the more specific. So, so again, this this is complexity that I have no idea how it works. Uh, and actually, Google don't know how it works because most of it is done through uh, machine learning. But this is basically a raw form of geocoding. So you give it some text, and it gives you a place. So for instance, we want to know where England is. You can see that the API is drawing the box around exactly where we need. Um, where are they any bigger? Bit of an awkward size map. Not conveniently, but we can basically see that. And again, so let's go more specific. So you can see it kind of getting more specific. And I don't know why that's gone so blue. Yeah, there we go. So we can see it's this is essentially geocoding. So we're going from a string of text to square and some coordinates. Naturally, uh, Google have gone out of their way to make me look foolish because if you give it the, you give it England, it gives a coordinate of extraordinary accuracy. Um, that is just uh, because it's easier to code with, so you don't need to worry about the error. We're not going to be doing anything uh, massively. We're not going to be doing anything massively coding with this API um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not worth our time. So the information we've already got here is already quite useful. It's just about picking what we want. Um, and more importantly, Google Maps charges for a certain amount of requests. Um, and we'd have to work that into Excel with um, uh, macros and um, other kind of subscripts. Um, so we're going to be doing it a bit of a, this is kind of a brute force method of doing it, but it works and it works well. So it's probably better if we go more specific because more specific is more useful. So what do we need for a geo reference? What pieces of information? A student longitude. Fantastic. Excellent. So we need a lat and a long. So that's a good starting point. I think I've impressed everyone. I have, yeah. Uh, always consistently, I cannot spell either of those two words. Uh, I, it is a matter of personal pride that I've done that first time. Um, 
Let's also make our lives a bit easier as well. Let's call that, let's make that obvious as to what it is. So let's put it in green. So we need to go from the word, the string Prague to two numbers. Uh, again, let's make our lives easier. So what degree of accuracy are we using? I know in my head, but let's start off well. So useful, but slightly sarcastic diagram here. So we could probably go to two or three decimal places, I reckon. Let's call it, let's call it two. So let's set ourselves up to win. So we can format those cells. Just going to be a number to two decimal places. So, yep, perfect. So that's going to help us lots. So, what would be best? Shall we go with? Let's go with the blunt one. Let's go with the blunt approach first. So this is where googling things comes in handy. So we just need to know those digits from Prague. So we can literally go to this interface. So, and we've acquired two latitude and longitude coordinates. And we can very, very simply just enter those into the spreadsheet. So they're always laid out that long. So it's 50.07. And 14.3. There we go. You've just geo referenced. That is the essence of a geo reference. Um, it's very brute force. Uh, it is literally copying and pasting repeatedly. Um, fortunately, Prague's quite a common one. Mind you, not in this data set, but it is in the actual one. So we can copy and paste that throughout so that we know we're absolutely spot on each time. Um, the slightly cleverer method, and this is still has its ups and downs and awkwardisms, is that I don't know which versions of Excel this works on. So it might work for you, it might not. Um, but we can define these arrive froms as places. So on Excel, you can go to data and then you can give them a geography type, which will take a little bit of time. And then it gives us this. So just out of interest, uh, has everyone got that option? Right, okay. I suspected that might be the case, in which case it's probably worth brute forcing this. Um, message in the chat. I would probably make a, a table of locations. Yeah. And then do a sort of lookup, which most versions can, can do it somewhere within the spreadsheet. And then have a an if error, if there's nothing, it's gonna come up, say, research more or, or highlight it in a color to, to do some more lookups and whatever and then maybe um yeah and then then it should should be easier without having to go through each one yeah yeah absolutely um again I, i'll uh, i'll kind of ashamedly admit that my approach was just a brute force it um <clears throat> and i just copied and pasted so that that's a far more um uh, or a far less resource intensive way of doing it. Um, and actually I wish I'd done that in the long run anyway. Um, but essentially, um, just to quickly go over this geographic data type that we've got here. So it's put question marks up on some of them. Doesn't like arrive from, that's because it's not a place, so we can ignore that. There are some places it really likes and there are some it really doesn't. Um, I don't know what problem it has with Carlisle, personally. Um, Tamworth does come up a lot. Uh, that's an awkward one. Um, 
But as we can see, I've tried to iterate that as much as possible. So we can't do much here, but we can tell that it's in England. So we've got some data out of nothing. Um, so we can probably ignore that. I, I've had problems between Washington DC and Washington County Durham. And I think that's the sort of place where you might have to put an extra bit of work in. Not that there's many Jews in County Durham, but there are <laughs> some. But, yeah. yeah. And the other one I found that it, this system doesn't like Wales. It can't get anywhere in Wales for some reason. And I've got no idea why. Um, but what we've got now is, so now these are a special data type. So we can add in a bit of information. So equals at cell, and then you put in a full stop. And we can add its latitude like this. And then we've got that. Same for the next one. So uh, equals E4 longitude. And then that's all filled out for us. Again, I think uh, lookup tables are probably the easier way of doing this, but I, 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 to be honest, I didn't realize Excel has moved a lot uh, in recent years. It's still not great though. It's got a massive problem with Vienna, and I have no idea why. Uh, it knows where Vienna is, but it won't give it the geographic coordinate. So we have to manually enter some of them. Uh, it's not too keen on Hong Kong either. Um, so it, it's problematic, and it's always worth going through again just to double check what it's trying to do. Um, again, I apologize to anyone that hasn't got this feature available to them. Um, at which point it's probably worth us moving straight on just in the interest of the time to the clean georect version which is three in the google drive i should also do another check are we all doing okay we're all having fun awesome Okay, so here we are with all of the hard work done. Um, and to be honest, that is the hardest part of this. Um, with the exception of a lat long, which I shouldn't have left in, as that's a, uh, that's a bit of a sneak preview. Um, in fact, do you know what? I'm gonna get rid of that now. So, all of these have been iterated into useful coordinates. Um, you'll notice I've also put in the zeros just so that each one has got a coordinate. That's quite important because a lot of software that iterates, uh, that, that, that reads latitude and longitude coordinates doesn't like it if there's a, if there's a nothing, but it's okay if there's a zero. Um, that's a, an awkward problem that we've had to negotiate uh, with the maps for the actual uh, mapping the temporary shelter map. And there are some other awkwardisms here that haven't been addressed as well, but they'll be for the next session. Um, so we're gonna start mapping this. Actually, Excel is pretty good. Um, Excel will do you a map, um, but it's a bit of a, well, it's a bit of a rubbish map, um, but if you go, da, 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 da. Does it work, you go. Oh, yes, it does. So it will recognize that there is a connection between the places you put and the data. Um, but that's rubbish because you can't do much with it. It doesn't show you much. It's not very fun to play with. So we are going to use something called. We're going to use something called Palladio. Um, now, this is a bit of a, hmm, I don't know how to frame it, but the, Palladio is a bit of a weird one because Palladio is one of the best tools um, for visualizing stuff, but it's riddled with problems. Um, so it's, it's very easy to use, it's completely free, and they are fantastic visualizations. They really do show off your data in an amazing way. However, 
it is really buggy. Um, you start putting in large data sets and they will complain, it will lag. Um, it can't be exported or displayed on a website, which is a little awkward as well. So for instance, uh, let's click on the Jewish Museum's website. So as we can see at the bottom here, this map fully functions, it's fully, it works as a Google map. It's got everything you need in it. It's all of the links work, you can change everything. Palladia, you can't do any of this. This is raw embedded map, um, which is what we will look at next week. We'll start looking at how we play around with this. Um, so that's a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, and it tends, it's recently been unsupported. It's quite old. Um, although when you play with it, it doesn't look old at all. It actually looks quite modern. Um, but it is a good prototyper. So you'll be able to see what the commonalities are, what an actual map would look like. So, because I'm rambling about Palladio, um, let's go to the Palladio site. Did I leave a reference on that? I think I did. So you can either search for Palladio Stanford in Google, and it's Palladio Humanities and Design, or it's the link here in the G drive. If everyone's got that to hand. So Palladio is awesome. Uh, I can't express that enough. Despite everything I've just complained about, it is awesome. It's really intuitive. Um, but like most computing things, it's got its rough edges. So we should always look about how we can play around with this. So where was it? So if we go to FAQs, so it needs, first of all, it's telling us that we need a header line. We need our information lines. They need to be separated by column, uh, but again, they need to be separated by commas. Um, other algorithms as well. There's a specific format for dates. Um, I think that's our only awkwardisms. Yes, those are the ones that I picked up. So we need to do a little bit more spreadsheet work just to make our lives completely straightforward. So with version three, unfortunately, these haven't been combined together in the way that it likes. So we need to create another column, which is what I called in the previous one, lat and long. And this will be our kind of power column. So we basically need to patch these two together into one data type. Does anyone know off the top of their head what you need to use? Concatenate. Yes, I love concatenate. Me too. You have so much fun with the concatenate function. Um, so you go for an equals, we insert latitude, um, followed by a comma. We also want a comma in between. So we add a column like that. Ooh. And then separate that out by another comma. Naturally, it won't work. I'm going to start that again. Right, from the top. So that's because I haven't put in the function. So we start with an e. Let's start this section again. So you put an equal sign. You can start writing. Um, I think any of the concatenate functions work easily. Um, I think I usually use concat uh, because we're not doing anything remarkably complex with our concatenation. 
So then you type the latitude, separate it with a comma, tell you you're looking for another data type, add your text color, or comma, and then add the longitude and then finish it off with a bracket. So it should look like that. So your formula should look like that. I kind of rushed over that. Does that make sense? They're kind of pulling on Excel for a lot of the georeferencing stuff here. Um, so this is essentially you're basically declaring to Excel that you're not looking for another variable, you're adding a text comma. And as a result, it will patch the two together with a comma. And then you can just drag it down. And then it adds all of that information for you. OK. I might give everyone a second just to do that, and not just so that I can reopen my spreadsheet with it pre-done. That's an incredible time saver. Um, Another top tip, instead of dragging the formula down, just double click on the bottom right and it will populate the whole column. Yeah, that's a huge time saver. Annoyingly, when you've got a bit of a patchy spreadsheet, though, I find that it, it tends to stop well, yeah. the one with the, which is a bit of a pain in the backside, yeah. but it does the job. Yeah. Uh, Double check there. So, right. So, we'll hopefully have something that looks like this. So, this is ready to go for Palladio, except one thing it's looking for, Palladio is looking for. A CSV file. A CSV stands for comma separated values. So it's a relatively straightforward process. So all we need to do is save that spreadsheet as a CSV. So we go on save, we go on file, save as. And then here, rather than an Excel workbook, we want comma delimited. Click on that and then save it. It will complain because there's more than one sheet, but that's fine. I won't save it because I've got a version here. And then we've got something that will look much less pretty, but much more functional. Failing that, to just open uh, the fourth spreadsheet because that's saved in the correct format. Okay, we all got that. Awesome, I'm seeing lots of nods. So we can now, now we've got Palladio open and ready. We can simply drag that over. So you can see comma separated values. The first line is always a header. And then it is just your Excel values, but rather than being separated by pretty tables, it's uh, divided by commas. And then we can load that. Then we've got this horribly intimidating box. So it's only intimidating because the spreadsheet had so many headings. And actually, it's done a good job. Um, I can remember going backwards and forwards with this uh, infernal piece of software to try and get it to recognize things. Um, so it knows admitted on is a date. Excellent. Dates are always the awkward ones. Um, that's text. That's fine. Arrive from is fine. It's noted the latitude and longitudes as well. So it's actually done us a real favor here. 
So let's type it as well. So we can go on map, and there's nothing loaded as yet. But on here, so whenever you geo reference, uh, it likes there's a big difference between data and layers. Uh, no, I've, I've said that incorrectly. There's a big difference. Well, there's a big thing about uh, layers. A layer is essentially something that goes over the image of a map. So this map here, and this is kind of an insight into what we'll do next week. Imagine that you've got a sheet with a picture of a map on it, and you lay the map out on a table. Um, we can't change that map image at all. That, that's not changing, that's rigid, that's not going anywhere. We're stuck with that particular background. What we can do though, is we can add things on top of that map. And that's essentially what we're doing here. So we've got the data loaded in the background. So we can add a layer. Let's just stick with points. Um, what should we call it? So shall we go with all this arrived from? So I've, I've tried to be clever here, and it's only because I've been uh, foolish for, throughout all of the iterations of this. Um, so we can pick a lat long. Let's give it a nice color. Red's a bit aggressive. It's actually a bit of a horrible shade of yellow, but it does the job. Let's also size the points as well. Um, and we can size them by various different factors, but I suppose number is probably the most useful. And then we can add that. That's unhelpful. So I know I've done wrong there. So we can name them by their arrival. There we go. So we're basically telling it to label them via the arrive from column. And apply that. Look at that. So now we've got all of these different places that people arrived directly from. I really shouldn't appear that. That yellow is awful, isn't it? That's absolutely terrible. Let's change that. That is amazing. Sorry, I just had to jump in there that is just so beautiful how it's done that well let, let's go one further uh because that's that's not the fun bit in my head so we can let's make these attached to others so that's the best way of doing that so if you add another layer but call it point to point so same process as before so source places so where are they arriving from Target places, where are they going to? Um, what should we name them? That's a bit of an awkward one. Perhaps this would have made sense earlier to put in the spreadsheet a kind of pathway rather than a, where they're coming from, where they're going. Um, let's say destination, specific destination. So that where they're going from, where they're going to. And I just click that. Yes, I did. Um, yes, show links. Yes, size points. Let's put it in a different color. According to number untitled, then let's add that. So now we've connected all of those points together. Um, oh, I did keep the RRF station in. That's useful. Um, so we can see here all of the different places and all of their different connections. And I mean, there's annoyingly, there's stuff to learn here. So first of all, a lot of them are null. A lot of them don't have a lot of uh, specific destinations, which is a bit annoying. So if you wanted to show off to your, um, to your audiences, you just get rid of all of them in the spreadsheet that had zeros. Um, you can also see that a lot of them have a start place that ends up nowhere. So perhaps there's a problem with the data there. Perhaps we could, um, perhaps it's not useful to determine where they're going from and where they're going to. 
that's a possibility. Maybe it makes more sense to map this to one consistent coordinate, which is, I think, what we did with the um, actual map. But there's a lot of stuff you can do here. Um, the only other cool feature that you can do is you can do this by date as well. So if we go down here to time span, annoyingly because I've kept in the 1900 dates, it's going to be a little, it looks fairly unspecific, but that's because it's including everything. Um, but we can see here, we can draw. I don't know whether you can see that on my screen or not, but we can draw a small segment of time and drag that along and we can see these change over time. Obviously that um, change might make more sense to make that really small. So you can see where people are moving and where. So we can draw a couple of conclusions. So London is a center, which isn't a massive surprise, but we can see that actually there's quite a large proportion of people moving up north. Um, a lot of them say Empress of Canada. There goes the bugs I was talking about. Yeah, so Empress of Canada is a common one. Liverpool is a common one. Uh, there's quite a lot uh, in this kind of Midlands area around Birmingham. So we're kind of seeing that data. We're kind of iterating that data in a useful way. That, and this is great fun to play with, the amount of time you can spend just seeing uh, where this data is pushing you towards is just incredible. Um, and yeah, the trouble is when the dates come up, it does tend to slow it down a bit. Um, and you can see what the commonalities are. Ooh. You can set your own facets, but I've never found that works particularly well. Um, so that is the bulk of the stuff you can do with Palladio. You can download this um, as a, what we call a JSON format, but that's not massively useful. This is better off left as kind of an online tool. Um, you can also see this in graph format as well, although this isn't particularly relevant for this data. I'm just going to refuse to load anyway. But basically, you can view it in different formats. Um, mapping is definitely where the power is here. Yeah, it really doesn't like the fact I put in the dates. So it's hit and miss. Um, but essentially, what we're doing here is we've successfully geocoded these spreadsheets and we've put that information on an iterable kind of interactive map. So have we all managed to find that? Have we all managed to display pretty lines and circles? Oh, it's just realizing that I've asked it to do something. Obviously, as the spreadsheets get bigger, this might get a bit slower. Um, that's uh, just the perils of this kind of unsupported software package. <coughs> Excuse me. So apparently my laptop doesn't like that either. So there are other kind of resources as well that you can do this with. Um, there's another one called Gephi, um, which is um, you have to actually install Gephi. But this is another interesting way of um, visualizing data and patterns between different locations. Um, I find it's a little bit heavier on the programming, but it's generally quite straightforward to use. And there are loads of tutorials online as well. Um, but generally, that is georeferencing at its most basic, uh, in many ways, quite blunt form. Uh, does anyone have any questions about any part of that process? Um, Palladio doesn't allow you to export it or view it on a web page, just on their web page. Yeah, so, so you can only really play with it in that window. But you can download that data that Palladio will read. So you can stop, download it, and then re-upload it 
for playing around with later. So if you found the perfect image that you wanted to use, you just have to screen grab it. Yeah. Okay. It, again, it's a little bit awkward, um, but it's kind of the it's the most powerful version of mapping that you can do that doesn't require an enormous amount of work. Yeah, it's amazing. I was showing. I remember being shown this as a um, as a researcher about four or five years ago, and I had the same reaction. I thought that's so cool, and it's just so straightforward to use. But again, the the, the power is actually you here, making sure everything's up to snuff. Um, so this is again, it's the the importance of cleaning it correctly and making sure everything works and. Uh, things like that. Any other questions? Nope. In which case, I'll pass back over to Adam. Thank you so much, Lewis. That was really, really interesting. Um, and I love how simple Palladio seems to be, where um, I've got a question on Playdio. Is there a step-to-step -step guide on the Playdio website, similar to how you went through it tonight? Yeah, the Palladio will do a lot. Uh, it will tell you how to use it, but it won't tell you about the spreadsheets. Um, so it, it can guide you through how, like, getting all of the um, time spans and timelines and facets to work, um, and graph and table view. But it won't tell you how to set, it will suggest how to set up that data, but it's not great at telling you what formats it's needed in. But there are tutorials online that, that play with this as well. Oh, it's great. I think it's so, it's so nice to see that data move from a spreadsheet, which can sometimes be tricky to sort of understand it and then see it so easily visualized on a map like this. Um, it, it's really great to see. Um, and also, I've learned several things myself about Excel tonight, so uh, thank you for that on a personal level. Um, if anyone does have any questions, there's still a couple more minutes to, uh, to ask those. I'm just going to, um, if you think, whilst you're thinking for a question, um, I'm just going to post a link in. You muted yourself, Adam. <laughs> Rather than post this on, into the chat, I just mute myself. But here we go. There's a link in the chat, which is a very quick um, feedback form. It shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes. Um, if you're happy to uh, click on that now and fill it in after the, the session, that'd be great. I'll, we'll also send it around via email tomorrow as well. Um, and the only other thing to say is if, uh, if you've enjoyed tonight and you'd like to attend next week's uh, workshop, which is moving on to a more advanced level of georeferencing off the back of this one, um, we very much welcome your attendance there as well. Um, there's also a talk which Lewis is doing at lunchtime, one o'clock next Thursday, uh, which goes into a bit more detail about um, the project itself and some of the aspects of the cards and, um, and what our results have been so far. So um, if you're available next lunchtime, uh, it'd be lovely to see you there too. Um, if there are no more questions, I think all that's left for me to say is another thank you to Lewis. And thank you all for attending tonight. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, got lots out of it. And um, and uh, the very final thing to say is uh, the results of all the work Lewis has been doing for us will soon be available on the Jewish Museum London's website itself. So um, hopefully in early April, you will be able to um, have a play with the map that Lewis has produced and some and view the data sets that relate to the Jews Temporary Shelter cards. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Cheerio. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. It's been great to work with you all. Thank you. I think the cats enjoyed it too. <laughs> great stuff.